Hello, welcome to the program. A court in Crimea has ordered 12 Ukrainian servicemen captured at sea be held for two months. Another 12 will be brought before the court on Wednesday. They and their three naval vessels were seized on Sunday near Crimea, the Ukrainian peninsula annexed by Russia in 2014. The men are not being treated as prisoners of war, but look set to face criminal charges of illegally crossing into Russia. Lebedeseko has more. Captured at sea by Russian forces and now sentenced in a Crimean court. One of 12 Ukrainian sailors ordered to be held until January. Russia says they crossed into its waters illegally, but Ukraine insists the incident happened in areas that are free to shipping. Russia's security service has released film statements from three of the captured Ukrainians, which were widely shown on state TV. One said that he was aware the actions of his Navy were provocative. We cannot verify the circumstances of the interviews, but Kiev says the men were forced to lie under duress. This footage, also released by Russia, apparently shows the incident which led to the crisis, the most serious escalation between the two countries in years. The Kerch Strait, where this happened, is the only way of accessing Ukraine's key ports in the Azov Sea, which both Russia and Ukraine are meant to share. But since Russia annexed Crimea four years ago, it's been able to block access in and out. On Monday, Ukraine imposed martial law, saying it's the victim of a deliberate act of aggression. I don't want anyone to think this is fun and games. Ukraine is under threat of full-scale war with Russia. The U.S. is calling on European countries to fully enforce the sanctions on Russia over its annexation of Crimea. It's a dangerous escalation on the part of uh, Russians' continued aggressive behavior against uh, Ukraine. The United States continues to support Ukraine's territorial integrity. The Secretary is heading to NATO, as uh, many of you know, uh, in, in the coming days. I would imagine that that would be a big topic of conversation. America says Russia violated international law, and President Trump now says he might cancel a meeting with President Putin at the G20 later this week. Mr. Trump says he doesn't like what is happening, but he hopes they'll be able to straighten things out soon. Le Boudiseco, BBC News. Let's pick up on that last point then and speak to our correspondent, Dan Johnson, who is in Washington for us now. So, uh, Dan, President Trump wading into this confrontation. Yes, and saying that he might go as far as calling off the meeting with President Putin that was scheduled to take place on the sidelines of the G20 later this week in Argentina. So I think that gives a clear indication that the White House and the Department of State, uh, the government here in Washington, feels that it is Russia that has overstepped the mark in this confrontation. Russia, of course, blames the Ukrainians for straying into their waters uh, around the coast of Crimea. Uh, but it seems the White House and the Department of State are all in agreement that this was Russia's act of aggression, a dangerous act of aggression as it's been described and that's why there is a call for greater sanctions, for sanctions to be fully applied on the Russians uh, and for more to be done through NATO, a call for European countries and Germany was named in particular to contribute more to NATO and to work harder through NATO to try and find a solution to this even though Ukraine's not a NATO member. Yes, I was just going to say, Dan, a real sense there this evening in Washington that uh, European nations could be doing more on this. Yes, and that's something that Donald Trump and the State Department have made clear before, that they feel European nations haven't done uh, their share of the funding of NATO and the heavy lifting when it comes to making decisions and taking action. So there is a big NATO meeting uh, scheduled. Uh, I'm sure Ukraine will be discussed there as a topic, and clearly uh, the U.S. feels that that is the forum in which uh, this issue should be tackled and should be taken forward. But Donald Trump saying that if he doesn't see enough progress there, or maybe as well as the progress there, when and he's got further details of exactly what happened on Sunday. He will consider whether to go ahead with this meeting with President Putin or not. OK, Dan Johnson in Washington. Thank you very much. The British government has expressed concern at the significant increase in migrant boats crossing the English Channel. 
Home Secretary Sajid Javid says the traffic is being organized by criminal gangs and he's promised more cooperation with the French authorities. This month alone, 110 migrants, many saying they are Iranian nationals, have made it to Kent on the English coast. All of them have been passed on to immigration officials. The French police say they believe the recent surge is down to tighter security at the Eurotunnel entrance and also because of Brexit, with migrants wanting to get to the UK before it happens. Our correspondent Colin Campbell reports. Rescued off the coast of Dover in an inflatable dinghy, these are migrants from northern France trying to get to Britain. In the last few months, there's been a surge in this kind of activity. A migrant camp in Dunkirk we're secretly filming using an undercover researcher. It's smugglers like this man who are at the heart of the problem, willing to risk lives for financial gain. A boat that will cost you three to four thousand pounds. I'm taking three people with me. They pay in cash. We get a boat and off we go. He says he was a fisherman in Iran and getting us across the channel would be easy. Look, I will check the weather. You have waves in the sea, ferries cross the water, and they can drag you underneath them even if one kilometer away. But I know the sea routes where you will not be disrupted by the ferries. More than a hundred migrants have reached the Kent coast by boat in the last three weeks, but not all that depart succeed. Farhad from Afghanistan was put in a dinghy with 11 others. He was rescued at night after the engine stalled. He thought he was going to die. It was freezing a couple of days ago, and when you get wet, we were full wet. I was like that to myself. A couple of guys, they actually fainted, you know, they went, they fainted, they were sleeping, and we were trying to wake him up, and they were. We are trying to wake him up because their hearts will stop from the cold. This migrant told me the boat he was in capsized after being battered by waves. Living in a squalid makeshift camp in Calais, they claim they fled their countries because of religious and political persecution. Their desperation to get to the UK is being fueled by fears of Brexit. How many of you think that it's going to get harder? Harder, put your hands up. You all think you all think it's going to get harder. There is a rush. Everybody's talking about it in here in the jungle. They're like that. We need to get in quicker. You know what I'm saying? In case the security gets tied up. Even as winter sets in and temperatures start to plummet here, migrants in this part of north of France are continuing to prepare to cross this treacherous stretch of water. It's happening at night time in the dark, and they're using their mobile phones to navigate across to the Kent coast. Waiting to catch a dinghy to the UK, these Iranian migrants told me they'd paid £6,000 each and were waiting to be taken to a nearby beach by smugglers. We have to go by boat. We know we are putting our life in danger. I've tried before, but the waves were three metres high and came up over the boat. I already stared death in the face. There are fears drowned migrants could wash up onto Calais beaches. Migrants trying to cross are risking their lives every night here in Calais. If the French authorities are doing enough, well, we try to stop them. Um, we stopped quite every boat that tried to cross the channel, but we, we need to face the truth. The truth is we cannot stop everyone. Overloaded with migrants, this was the boat stopped by French authorities this morning. They were rescued, but there's real fear lives may soon be lost. Colin Campbell reporting from Dover. Let's take a look at a few more stories now. And Indonesian authorities are set to release the preliminary findings into why a Boeing 737 plummeted into the Java Sea, killing all 189 people on board last month. Some of the grieving families have launched a legal challenge for compensation from Boeing. And there is also intense pressure on the budget air Lion Air over its safety record. President Macron of France has said that nationwide protests against higher fuel taxes will not stop him moving the country to cleaner energy. Mr Macron wants all coal-fired power stations in France closed by 2022, but he says he understands the anger of protesters. And Stephen Hillenberg, the creator of the hit children's cartoon series SpongeBob SquarePants, has died. He was 57 and had been diagnosed with motor neurone disease. 
The show, which was set underwater, was inspired by Mr. Hillenburg's early career as a marine biology teacher. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will meet his counterpart from Mexico's new government on Sunday for talks over a possible deal that would see asylum seekers wait in Mexico while their claims are processed. A caravan of thousands of migrants made up largely of Hondurans has in recent days started to arrive at the U.S. border. Our correspondent Will Grants has sent this update from a migrant camp in Tijuana. The migrants camp here in Tijuana is reaching a sort of critical mass after the first caravan of migrants from Honduras was caught up with by a second and third with people from El Salvador and Guatemala. The result is that there are thousands of people in this space that simply isn't adequate for them. There isn't enough space, there isn't enough food, and as you can see around me, every square meter of this area has been taken up with by a cheap tent uh, or temporary accommodation put together with plastic sheeting, tarpaulins, and pieces of wood. Of course, the migrants are generating a lot of rubbish, a lot of waste. Amnesty International have described the conditions here as squalid, and having been around the camp for some time now, it would be difficult to disagree with that assessment. After the protest on Sunday, which was uh, met with tear gas fired from the U.S. side of the border, uh, Mexico has requested an investigation from the U.S. authorities as to what happened. And the migrants themselves have a few choices to make. Some will choose to stay here in Tijuana, where temporary work visas may be made available. Others have already decided to go home, deciding that enough is enough and that these conditions aren't sustainable. Others still will continue to try to cross that border wall that you can see behind me and make it into the United States either legally or illegally. But either way, Christmas is coming uh, in due course. The nights are getting much colder and people will be here probably well into the new year. Will Grant into you on affair. Stay with us here on BBC News, still to come. Lots to answer for. Campaigners and politicians ask, where's Mark Zuckerberg, as Facebook faces questions over fake news. President Kennedy was shot down and died almost immediately. The murder of John Kennedy is a disaster for the whole free world. He caught the imagination of the world the first of a new generation of leaders. Margaret Thatcher is resigning as leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister. Before leaving number 10 to see the Queen, she told her cabinet, it's a funny old world. Angela Merkel is Germany's first woman chancellor, easily securing the majority she needed. Attempts to fly a hot air balloon had to be abandoned after a few minutes, but nobody seemed to mind very much. As one local comic put it, it's not hot air we need, it's hard cash. Cuba has declared nine days of mourning following the death of Fidel Castro at the age of 90. Castro developed close ties with the Soviet Union in the 1960s. It was an alliance that's brought the world to the brink of nuclear war with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Welcome back. You're watching BBC News, the latest headlines. The U.S. calls on Europe to do more to support Ukraine in its conflict with Russia over the Crimean Peninsula. And a sharp increase in migrant boats crossing the channel to the U.K. The U.K. government says the traffic is being organised by criminal gangs. Voters in the U.S. state of Mississippi have been casting their ballots in a special runoff for the last Senate seat of the midterm elections. No candidate reached 50 percent on the 6th of November. President Trump has been a big supporter of Republican candidate Cindy Hyde-Smith, but her campaign has been overshadowed by comments made about public hangings. That has reopened some old wounds in a state with a difficult history of race relations. Well, our correspondent Chris Buckler is in Mississippi in the uh, town of Oxford. Uh, so Chris, when will we start getting results then? Yeah, the polls have now closed and they are being counted at the moment. The votes 
And certainly the early indications we have are that they're going to follow along what the opinion polls suggested, and that is that Cindy Hyde-Smith is looking likely to win the seat. However, it is very early still. We are waiting to see exactly what the votes finally say. But the fact that this has even been a contest, this has been a relatively tight battle, will be something of a victory for the Democrats. And a lot of that does come down to the comments that Cindy Hyde-Smith made during this campaign, particularly that comment that if a supporter was to hold a public hanging, that she would be in the front row. That has particularly caused problems for the Republican Party here. And that's because it does look back towards potentially racial lynchings that took place in this state many years ago and something that a lot of people still remember and still causes a great deal of shame in this state. As a result, we had President Trump here really trying to buoy her support on the eve of the election. It does feel like that has worked. At the same time, though, given that this is a holiday period, Thanksgiving has just passed, Christmas is coming, there's also been this real problem of getting the vote out for both Democrats and Republicans. Certainly today they've said that the votes have been slow but steady. Uh, but it's, it, it's pretty clear that actually as far as Republicans and Democrats are concerned that both could have got more votes out potentially. But as I say, at the moment it does, it does look like Cindy Hyde-Smith is edging it, but we'll not know until a little later. So in terms of what this means for Washington, it won't change the balance of power in the Senate, will it? So is it more about the perception of, of how close they uh, run this race? Well, as you know, Duncan, apart from anything else, President Trump likes to win. And he had very much put his own support behind Cindy Hyde-Smith. And he was determined to get 53 seats in the Senate as opposed to 52. Of course, Republicans need 50 seats at least in that 100-seat Senate in order to make sure that they can pass laws, they can push forward President Trump's policy. Of course, while he can be comfortable about the Senate, what is the real problem for President Trump coming up is the House of Representatives, which is now going to be a Democrat majority. That's where he could find himself struggling to get legislation passed and where he could find a lot of investigations being launched by committees into his dealings and into his policies. Chris Buckler in Mississippi, thank you very much. And we'll keep an eye on those results uh, in the coming hours here on BBC News. Efforts to tackle climate change are way off track, according to the United Nations, which is hosting a major climate conference in Poland next week. Last year, greenhouse gas emissions reached a record high, and it's not just a matter of industrial pollution. Food is also a factor, with livestock producing methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. Our science editor David Shukman reports on how our food choices have an impact on the planet. Every breath from a cow, and especially every burp, releases methane, 600 litres every day. Most from the front end, not the back. And because methane warms the planet, the more we eat beef and dairy products, the more the temperatures rise. At this farm, researchers encourage the cows to feed inside this hood, so they can measure the methane. There's a, been a huge increase in meat and milk consumption. Uh, that demand is going to continue, so I think we need uh, strategies for sustainably producing that meat and milk. One option is adding special supplements to the feed. Some of these make the cows a lot less gassy. But on its own, that won't be enough to head off the worst of global warming. So it comes down to the key and highly controversial question of what we all choose to eat. Here at Manchester University, researchers study the climate cost of food. The fertilizers, tractors and processing all generate gases that cause more warming. So add all that up, and these chocolates are responsible for up to 1.4 kilos of carbon dioxide and other gases. That's the equivalent of driving for 12 miles in a car. Producing this BLT sandwich involves a kilo of gases. That's like driving for eight miles. And this serving of beef comes out top, creating more than three and a half kilos of warming gases. That's like a journey of 30 miles. So what does this mean for our everyday shopping? Well, Mike Berners-Lee helps supermarkets to work out their climate costs. The differences are striking. So making the switch from beef and lamb down to um, plant-based proteins 
is uh, about f one fiftieth of the carbon footprint. There are still some simple rules of thumb. So is it either in season or is it robust enough to have been able to have traveled from elsewhere in the world on a boat? Mike and other experts say they don't want to preach about low carbon food, but they say if we want to tackle climate change, we need to eat less of this. David Truckman, BBC News. Politicians from nine different countries have expressed their anger after the Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg refused to appear as part of an international inquiry into so-called fake news, despite being asked repeatedly to attend. The politicians were left having to question Facebook's European policy chief at Westminster, leaving an empty chair for Mr Zuckerberg. Our technology correspondent Rory Ketland jones reports. They had demanded the boss, and they weren't happy that Mark Zuckerberg declined their invitation. So the Facebook executive sent in his place came under immediate attack from a Canadian MP at this multinational hearing. Our democratic institutions, our form of civil conversation, seem to have been upended by frat boy billionaires from California. So Mr. Zuckerberg's decision not to appear here at Westminster to me speaks volumes. And the pressure continued to mount. Facebook cannot be trusted to make the right assessment on what can properly appear on its platform. It has become a serious threat to modern democracy. Do you accept that Facebook needs to be regulated? At the weekend, documents were seized by a Commons official from an American executive whose firm, maker of an app hunting down bikini photos, is in a legal dispute with Facebook. Why didn't Facebook disclose that? The man who ordered this highly unusual move described one seized email, which he said suggested Facebook had known about Russian interference for years. An engineer at Facebook notified the company in October 2014 that entities with Russian IP addresses have been using a Pinterest API key to pull over 3 billion data points a day through the ordered Friends API. Now, was that reported to any external body at the time? Facebook later released a statement saying the end Institute flagged their concerns, subsequently looked into this further and found no evidence of specific Russian activity. Mark Zuckerberg may have been a no-show today, but the political pressure on his company shows no sign of letting up. Rory Kathleen Jones, BBC News. The British Prime Minister Theresa May is on a tour of Britain to promote her Brexit deal to voters. Mrs May insists that the deal, which has been widely criticised across the political spectrum, protects the vital interests of the whole of the UK as it leaves the European Union. So what kind of trade deals could Britain strike with other countries under the terms of Theresa May's Brexit deal? Remember President Trump saying the deal looked good for the EU but could prevent future trade deals between the UK and the US. Is he right? Our business editor Simon Jack has been looking at the possibilities. Well, the first thing worth saying is that the UK already does a lot of trade with the US. In fact, the US buys more UK goods and services than any other single country by miles. UK exports to the US in 2016 were worth £99 billion a year. That's nearly double what we sell to Germany and much more than we do to France and Ireland. But to the EU in total, we sell £241 billion worth of goods a year, so it's still our biggest trading partner overall. Now, there is no reason that existing trade with the US should be affected. But what Mr Trump may have meant is that the PM's plan could make it hard to strike a new trade deal with the US. And there, he may have a point. The UK is due to leave the EU at the end of March next year, but there will then be a transition or a status quo period until December 2020 at least. Now, during which time, the UK can negotiate new deals, but they can't come into force until that period is over. And if a deal is not done by then, the backstop designed to ensure the Irish border remains open could be triggered, which again means the UK stays in the custom union with the EU, making a trade deal with the US very difficult. Even if a deal is eventually done with the EU, Theresa May's plan talks about a close alignment with the EU on rules and regulations, which could make doing a US deal tricky as it has different standards for things like food. But remember, as we've seen, with the UK's existing trade with the US, you don't necessarily need a trade deal to do trade. That was Simon Jack rounding off our coverage this hour. Do stay with us, though. There's plenty more to come. I'm Duncan Golastani. Thank you for your company. Bye-bye.
Hello there. We've replaced our cold, dry weather now with something a lot more unsettled, wet, windy and much milder conditions, which will be with us, in fact, for the next few days. Now, through today, this next area of low pressure means business is going to be quite a deep area of low, bringing gales and heavy rain. In fact, there could be some disruption to travel throughout today. So keep tuned to your BBC local radio for all the local updates there. Now we're starting the day off though on a pretty mild note. We've lost the overnight frost that we've seen for the last week or so. Temperatures uh, starting off around uh, 6 to 8 degrees. Now we're dragging this milder air from the Azores on a southwesterly wind. Might not feel so mild though because of the gales and the rain, but it really will be milder than what we've been used to. Spells of pretty heavy rain through the morning, moving northwards, followed by some showery bursts of rain further south uh, during the afternoon, and then an area of uh, much heavier persistent rain for Scotland, where we could see some pretty high rainfall totals on the hills there. Temperatures, double figures for all, as high as 14 or 15 across the southeast, but it's going to be very windy indeed. 60, 65 miles an hour in exposure across western coasts, and then later in the day, closer to 70 miles an hour, perhaps to the northeast of Scotland and the Northern Isles. And it's a brief window of fine weather during uh, Wednesday evening before the next bout of wet and windy weather starts to spread into the south of the country as we head into the early part of Thursday. Now, there could be a very uh, windy spell of weather across parts of Wales and the western half of England through Thursday morning as this ne next little area of low pressure moves northeastwards. And with it again, a spell of pretty heavy rain, which will clear through. And by Thursday afternoon, we should see a little bit of brightness breaking out. Just a few blustery showers, maybe heavy and thundery across southwestern areas. Temperatures down a degree or so on Wednesday's values, closer to 9 to 13 degrees. As we end the week, low pressure still very much in charge. Again, very windy, particularly across northern areas. As you can see tightly packed isobars there. But it's going to be, I think, a bright day on Friday. Most of the showers, the blustery showers, will be across northern and western areas. And these will be increasingly wintry over the hills, as it will be a chillier day across the north, but very blustery again, a risk of gales across Scotland, maybe into the far north of England. Blustery across the south, but not quite as windy as it'll be further north. And you'll notice a little bit cooler, temperatures of 9 to 10 or 11 Celsius. As we head on in towards the weekend, we maintain an unsettled theme, quite blustery, strong southwesterly winds, again fairly mild across England and Wales, something a bit cooler though for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Our World is a unique series of films on the BBC. I want to be able to bring her home. Offering personal insights into global events. Our World, stories that speak for us. Saturday and Sunday nights at 9.30 on the BBC News Channel. I'm Katty Kane, Washington. I'm Christian Fraser in London. Let's start with the European Union. Brexit. Russian interference. Donald Trump's Twitter feed. Yeah, we, yeah. Uh, we'll move on. I think there are going to be a lot of questions now. Yeah. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. We're nearly out of time. This is a big deal. Beyond 100 Days, Monday to Thursday, on the BBC News Channel. Hello, this is BBC News, the latest headlines. The US State Department has called on European countries to do more to support Ukraine in its conflict with Russia over the Crimean Peninsula. Earlier, a court in Crimea ordered the first 12 Ukrainian sailors captured by Russia on Sunday to spend two months in detention. Polls have closed in the U.S. state of Mississippi, where voters have been choosing a new senator. If the Republican candidate, Cindy Hyde-Smith, wins the vote, President Trump's party will extend its Senate majority to 53. She has faced a tough challenge, though, from the Democrat, Mike Espy. And the British government says there's been a significant increase in migrant boats crossing the English Channel. The Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, says the traffic is being organised by criminal gangs. Now on BBC News, it's Tuesday in Parliament.
Hello and welcome to the programme. Coming up, what are the government's plans for immigration after Brexit? The Home Secretary is staying tight-lipped for now. Are you, in your EU immigration policy, trying to meet your net migration target, yes or no? I've answered your question. MPs crack down on fake news. I think Facebook have told us again and again a tissue of lies about the way your company operates. And big fashion firms reject claims they're producing chuck-away clothes. We're proud of the, the quality and the durability of our garment. They're not, they're not bought to... They're not bought to Throw away. But first, the Home Secretary's told MPs he's planning to publish the government's strategy for future immigration before Christmas. The long-awaited white paper in the jargon will set out what the new rules could look like. When Sajid Javid appeared before the committee that scrutinises his department, the MPs wanted to know when they'd get to see it. And he was asked about reports from the London Evening Standard newspaper that the Prime Minister's desire to clamp down on low-skilled immigration was causing tension in the Cabinet. What's in the white paper, obviously it will talk to the new immigration system and it's intended that that new immigration would begin in January 2021 which is at the, either if there's a, a deal, it's at the end of the implementation period, even if there's not a deal, there clearly will be the time will be needed to bring in that new immigration system. And you speak as though you know what's in the immigration white paper, well, which, makes it, all the more, so which makes it all the more surprising that you're not prepared to actually publish it now. There were reports uh, in the last few days that the Prime Minister wanted to try and beef up support uh, for her withdrawal agreement by promising the British public even stronger restrictions on migration into this country. And it sounds as though, from the, from the evening standard, that that's being resisted uh, by you and others. <coughs> I just wonder if you could inform us a little bit more about these discussions that are going on. Well, um, I mean, first of all, I do know what's in the draft immigration white paper, something that I've been taking very seriously. I see this as a, a very uh, important moment for this government. So the first time in, in decades for any government we're able to design an immigration system uh, that are almost from scratch, uninhibited by any EU rules or regulations. Um, I, I'm happy to say a bit, if it's helpful, just a, the, about the sense of direction of the paper, if that's helpful uh, for you, Mr. Chope. Well, I, well yeah. I think, in a, in a sense, you've already said that in the past. You, you mentioned it at the yeah. party conference, the Prime Minister yeah. has leaked it and all the rest of it. So the question I'm going to ask is, are you in charge of this white paper, or is the Prime Minister in charge of it? Well, I, I think, as with all white papers from any government department, I'm in charge of the white paper, but with the final product, we need cross-government approval, and that of course includes the Prime Minister's approval. On the forthcoming white paper, um, will it cont contain the uh, tens of thousands immigration target? Um, the white paper is, is not complete yet, so we'll have to wait for its publication. Do you still support the target? You'll have to wait for the white paper. Well, the target, the, remember that, uh, the, actually, to put it in perspective, the, the white paper is about our future <coughs> immigration system. Yeah. The, the target is for, uh, is, is what's being set out, what you call the target, the, the, uh, the ambition that was set out in the oh, Conservative the Party target. manifesto uh, was for, is for this parliament. I think you've just now, he was pressed over whether the government was still of, uh, aiming to bring net migration, migration down to the tens of thousands. We've had a long discussion about what should be in the cap, what should be part of a um, seasonal workers mm. scheme. None of it is commensurate with a fixed tens of thousands. Is it? And this is perfectly obvious, so why not just say it and let's get it over with? You'll have to wait for the white paper. Currently, your policy to be trying to meet the net migration target? I'm trying to bring net migration overall, including EU migration, down to more sustainable levels. Are you, in your EU immigration policy, trying to meet your net migration target, yes or no? I've answered your question. I'm trying to bring down net migration overall. It is very difficult, <coughs> because if we're talking about net migration, it's very difficult. It, it, for any government. Okay, you haven't answered my question because it's really clear because you've got this thing that was in the Conservative Manifesto and I accept that you may not like it but it was in the Conservative Manifesto and it says, whether it's an aspiration, whether it's a target, whatever, it has this number attached to it which is the tens of thousands 
for your overall net migration objective. So all I am simply trying to ask is when you've got this white paper or this, this EU immigration policy or whatever it is that's going to come down the track for EU citizens, is the purpose of that policy to meet that net migration objective aspiration whatever of the tens of thousands? Yes or no? I think I've answered your question. I think you really, really haven't. Yvette Cooper and Sajid Javid there. Well, elsewhere on the committee corridor, the health secretary was facing questions about what life after Brexit might be like for his department. A Labour MP wanted to know if he'd really given the cabinet a dire warning about what a no deal could mean. You reported as having told the cabinet that in the event of a no deal Brexit, you couldn't guarantee that people wouldn't die. Is that your view? That's, uh, well, we don't comment on leaks. Uh, that isn't uh, exactly what I uh, said. And we have been very clear that if everybody does what they need to do, then we can ensure continuity of supply. So you can, you can guarantee in front of this committee that nobody will die as a result of a no-deal Brexit? Well, as my permanent secretary tells me, we shouldn't use words like guarantee. We should, uh, what we can say is that we're confident that if everybody does what they need to do, then there'll be uh, uh, this, the, the continuity that we'll talk about. Uh, you said a little while ago that you thought no deal was unlikely. Uh, but your fellow cabinet uh, minister, Amber Rudd, said last week that no deal wouldn't happen because Parliament would stop it. Uh, do you not agree with her? Uh, well, I think Parliament should vote for the deal that's on the table because I think it's the no, best deal. No, but my question was, she, she says, you, you, you say it's unlikely. She says it won't happen because Parliament will stop it. Well, I think that people should vote for the deal. I mean, I'm not... Uh, uh, that is the government policy. It's but the government position. The Secretary of State, don't waste our time. Everyone, well, knows, then, uh, yeah. no, everyone knows this deal is doomed. <laughs> it's going down. So when we're facing a no-deal scenario, do you agree with Amber Rudd that Parliament would stop it? I am planning for all eventualities, and that, of course, includes no deal. Matt Hancock. For a second day, there were questions in Parliament about Russia's capture of three Ukrainian naval vessels and 23 crew off the coast of Crimea. Ukraine has responded by imposing martial law for a 30-day period in 10 of its border regions. Ukrainian gunboats and a tug were sailing into the Kerch Strait on Sunday. Russia's border guard says the flotilla violated Russian territorial waters. Ukrainian calls it a flagrant violation of international law. There's been fighting in eastern Ukraine since April 2014 when Russia annexed the peninsula. We condemn Russia's aggression against the Ukrainian vessels that sought to enter the sea of Azov on the 25th of November. We remain deeply concerned about the welfare of the Ukrainian sailors detained by Russia and call for their release urgently. Russia has again shown its willingness to violate Ukraine's sovereignty following the illegal annexation of Crimea and construction of the Kerch Bridge. The United Kingdom remains committed to upholding the rules-based international system, which Russia continues to flout. He was responding to a question from a Conservative former Cabinet Minister who called for stronger sanctions against Russia. And will he also look at imposing personal sanctions on those military personnel who have already been shown to be involved in coordinating this operation, as well as increasing the economic sanctions on Russia, at least to the level uh, of which Canada and the United States are already imposing? The minister agreed it was a serious escalation of the situation. Any further sanctions will be considered in cooperation with European partners and others. It's very important there is a sense of unity in relation to response to what has taken place. And the United Kingdom uh, was active in calling a meeting of EU partners yesterday. And the other meetings that took place also saw a very strong response from the United Kingdom and others. The events of the last 48 hours have been deeply troubling for all of us who want to see a return to peace, stability and the rule of law across the whole of Ukraine. Instead, instances like this make an already intense situation worse and risk widening of the conflict. Every time we see one of these acts, we see a moment of Russian weakness being expressed through violence. We see a falling oil price being covered up by an act of aggression. We see riots against the pensioners who have been stripped of their assets by this brutal regime being covered up by further acts of war. Would he not agree with me that this means that we must stand with the Russian people, we must stand with the Democrats, the journalists and the uh, 
civic activists in Russia. This has not been an isolated incident. This has been happening and escalating for some time. I endorse the call, the call for unity, calm and restraint. But there are other consequences that we must be aware that Russia is seeking here, which is a wider destabilization of the region. Madeleine Moon. Now, 24 politicians from nine different countries joined forces to question Facebook as part of its inquiry into fake news. The self-styled International Grand Committee featured MPs from the Digital, Culture, Media and Sport Committee. But the man they wanted to question, Facebook's founder, Mark Zuckerberg, said he wasn't able to be in London and the committee left his chair empty. Instead, the company sent one of his employees, who's also a member of the House of Lords, to answer questions. The corporate decision of Facebook to blow off this meeting with Mark Zuckerberg, was that, uh, how was that arrived at? Who gave Mr. Zuckerberg the advice to ignore this committee? Uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't um, characterize the decision as a blowing off. It was a decision that we took to try and understand. Uh, um, so you say it's not blowing off. You're trying to understand. We're trying to understand. Who advised Mr. Zuckerberg? Was that his decision or did Facebook say to protect Mr. Zuckerberg to stay away from this meeting? I, I will take responsibility for decision making around appearances in front of committees. Um, we just, for the record, have appeared in front of uh, numerous committees this year of different institutions, including Mr. Zuckerberg himself appearing before two congressional committees.